want to say thanks to the organizers, uh, DCN, this is my first uh, association with the group, and also to the organizers here in, uh, in Greece as well. Um, as we just listened to the, the theme of this uh, presentation originally was China's economic statecraft, the potential and limits of influence in the post-COVID world. And I will talk about that, but uh, especially with Vlad's initial presentation and this overview of trust, truth, and influence, I really want to hit on all of those topics as they relate to China. So I am going to spend the first part of my discussion talking about the, these other two elements uh, that are core themes of the event, so trust and truth, and then I'll finish things off with a discussion uh, about influence, which is more of the focus of my research, uh, especially these aspects of economic influence. Um, the key takeaway is that China wants to be seen as trustworthy, truthful, and to be influential but in all of these aspects, there are challenges and limitations, some of which are also potentially very disruptive. So that'll be much of the theme that I look at in each of these categories, trust, truth, uh, and influence. So let me start with trust. So this, this all may sound a little bit um, odd, but let me talk a little bit first about how China frames uh, its view of what it thinks it's doing uh, on the global stage. Uh, it's really important for China to be seen as reassuring the world that its growth and rise are not going to be disruptive, that they're peaceful, and China badly wants to be liked. So let me talk a little bit about those two things for, for just a minute, and then I'll talk about some of the, the, the challenges uh, to that. Um, so you've probably heard of the term soft power. Uh, I spent uh, almost a decade on the uh, international relations faculty of a Chinese university and this topic came up almost every day. There is almost a, a, a literal obsession with the concept of soft power uh, in China, much debated term, but one way of thinking about it, I think in the Chinese framework, is basically China wants to be liked. Um, and uh, this is something that it strives to do often very ineffectively, uh, but it's something that, uh, that I think is a really important part of this uh, issue of, of trust. China wants to be trusted, wants to be liked. On the, on the trust side of things, um, this idea of reassurance has been a central part of China's foreign policy going back to uh, at least the 90s. You hear a lot in China about uh, mutually beneficial relations, uh, about win-win outcomes, a lot of this is China trying to signal to the world, especially developing countries, which I'll get into a little bit more later, um, that, that China's rise is going to be mutually beneficial, including in terms of mutual development. So we hear a, a lot about this. But China officially changed its foreign policy framework from one of uh, peaceful rise in the mid-2000s to peaceful development. This is really the, the key core framework that China tells itself and tells the world that it's doing, that its rise is peaceful, that it's not going to upset the apple cart in the way that other countries may have done in the past, uh, and that it's um, mutually beneficial, again, on the development side of things. Again, this is the rhetoric, the propaganda, deeply embedded in the way that China views the world and what it wants to communicate and what it wants others to believe. Um, as, as recently as around 2010, books were written about China's charm offensive, in particular in Southeast Asia. They kind of tried to capture the way that China was trying to build on, on its efforts to create soft power and be perceived as a benign country, both in its own region and, and globally. And, and by the way, much of this effort and signaling has been directed at, at the United States. Um, Clearly much of that uh, has, has not worked out as intended on the Chinese side. But now, in place of this idea of a charm offensive, we see a lot of talk of China's wolf warrior diplomacy. So become much more assertive in the last few years uh, about defending its interest and priorities on the global stage. So 
this, these efforts certainly do not go unchallenged on the trust side, and I want to talk just uh, about a few of those here. Um, so one of them, uh, there's basically rising distrust, both within China about the rest of the world and much of the rest of the world about China. So despite all these efforts uh, for China to be liked and to reassure, uh, often uh, that, that has uh, not worked out as intended. So uh, one of these aspects is a rising sense um, uh, that interdependence, economic interdependence in particular, is no longer without risk for China. Uh, this was always the case when China entered the WTO, for example, 20 years ago. There were lots of discussions about the risks of interdependence. But generally speaking, since the 80s, China has embraced interdependence with the rest of the world. This is changing rapidly. Uh, as we speak. So discussions within China about the rest of the world, economic interdependence, supply chain interdependence, many different aspects. This has changed rapidly in the last few years. China no longer believes that economic and other types of interdependence are necessarily in its interest. And this has also led to distrust. So lots of, many aspects of this certainly touch uh, on the US-China relationship and uh, the, the strategic rivalry there. Another important aspect of this certainly relates to the coronavirus. Um, China has become increasingly defensive on the one hand about the fact that the virus originated in China, and we heard about this yesterday, and certainly this is one of the key issues of, of trust and truth that's out there related to China and the coronavirus right now. So China's very defensive uh, about its own role in the origins of the virus, but on the other hand, it has become very assertive and offensive in a certain way about saying that, well, China's form of government and governance is, uh, has effectively dealt with the virus and that its uh, engagement on the global stage has helped to uh, combat the virus. So China, on the one hand, is very defensive and on the other hand, has uh, gone on a diplomatic uh, and otherwise uh, offensive on the global stage related to the coronavirus. And again, a lot of this has to do with, with questions of, of truth as well. And then the third aspect uh, of the sort of pushback or the decrease in, in trust or some of the challenges China has with being liked and trusted uh, are uh, related to Hong Kong and, and Xinjiang. Uh, so we, we, certainly China's commitment to, to, to Hong Kong is something that much of the rest of the world looks at and says, well, you broke that. Commitment certainly this isn't the way that's seen in in China, but this is one of the big issues again of trust, and then also uh, in in Xinjiang uh, in terms of human rights and the way that uh, the Chinese government has treated the Muslim and Uyghur population there. So those are those are all issues that sort of make it difficult for for China to maintain uh, these efforts or be successful in some of its efforts uh, at at being seen as trustworthy. Let me talk a little bit uh, about truth. Um, this is a, a, a big one and a, and a tough one. Uh, this is, uh, we've been talking a lot at this conference about sort of clear mistruths or perceived mistruths. Well, in China, the ultimate arbiter of truth is the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and it is easier for the Chinese Communist Party to rule over, to decide on what is truth within China, but that doesn't stop it from attempting to do so outside of China. So much of the propaganda, the outreach, uh, the way that China tries to influence global public opinion about China on many different issues uh, is, is all part of a similar system, institutional system and, and approach uh, that China has. Uh, it is used to having many levers of control domestically. Uh, it tries to bring those out and be effective on the global stage as well, but it's obviously much more, more difficult. It doesn't stop them from trying. Uh, so we see a lot of efforts uh, to, to control global narratives uh, on, about China and about issues including the coronavirus um, and about China's economic interdependence, the Belt and Road Initiative um, are all part of this. So three key aspects uh, of this effort to control the truth. First of all, the story China tells itself and tells its people is that it is pursuing, or that the Communist Party says that it's doing, is that it's pursuing development and stability. So you'll even hear this 
most statements about China and Afghanistan right now are going to say something about development and stability. Stability, we want stability for the people in the country of Afghanistan, and we want development, and maybe we'll help them with both, um, and those, those two things go together. These are, these are very common lines, but they're also very important for uh, domestic political economy inside of China. A second aspect of what China tells the world is that it is providing global public goods and that includes in the areas of development, so the Belt and Road Initiative, building infrastructure uh, around the world, especially in developing countries, but also its COVID response. The way that China is constructing what it's doing globally uh, is, is revolves around this idea of providing global public goods, again, in a way to be seen as trusted and, and, and liked. Um, I, th I think it's interesting, uh, maybe we can talk about this a little bit more later. Um, I think it's, it's important to note that China is not Russia nor the Soviet Union, um, yet it learned a lot in terms of its playbook, uh, in terms of its own institutions, um, how it deals with its own media, uh, how it tries to confront the way that uh, narratives or stories are constructed um, how media presence operates outside of China about China. So there was certainly a lot of learning that, that China did uh, from the Soviet Union, um, but there was also a lot of competition even back then. Uh, China and the Soviet Union uh, were, were heated rivals at the very least uh, from the 60s uh, through the, the 70s and into the 80s. Um, and despite the fact that there's a lot of cooperation between Russia and China today, uh, I think we would be mistaken to see them as equivalent in terms of many of these issues of trust, truth, uh, and, and, and influence. The, the capacities and the limitations, the, the aims that both countries have are quite different. Um, and I know that Russia looms large for many here, uh, and I think it's just important to make this distinction uh, with, with China on that account. Um, within China and outside of China, there are certainly alternatives to the Chinese Communist Party's version of the truth. It's certainly the space for contesting what the party says within China has become increasingly constrained over the last few years. Uh, but there had been vigorous debate on many, many issues. Uh, from society to economics to, to politics. Again, the space is constrained. I think we would be misled to think that those debates have been completely shut down. It's just very difficult for us often to, to know what they are and many of the voices who are arguing for an alternative um, pathway, including more liberal economic policies, for example, have, it's, it's harder for them. Um, but outside of China, we also see that there are lots of ways in which the truths that the Chinese government and party present are, are contested. Um, I think it's important uh, as we, we think about how to challenge or contest these truths uh, that the Chinese government and, and party present, Fly really likes the phone microphone, um, as we look at how these truths are presented and, and contested, I think it's important uh, that we also are truthful and as close to the facts as possible, and that any alternatives are viable and competitive. So one example of this, I think it's a negative example, was under the Trump administration, there was a lot of discussion of debt trap diplomacy. This idea basically was that China lent money, especially to developing countries with the intention that those debts could not be repaid and then China would take over, for example, ports in Sri Lanka uh, or railways uh, in African countries or canals uh, in Latin America. This narrative is not based on very careful, factual argumentation and has been eviscerated by those who've looked at it carefully. This is not an effective policy if you are a government or someone trying to say, well, there's problems with the way that China is doing this. It defeats the purpose. So this, you cannot fight back against or try to present alternatives if you do not, uh, if you're not telling the truth yourself. And then on the other side, there are these issues of Get him? <laughs> um, there are these issues of trying to present an alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative that China has brought out. 
Um, and that, I must have really, uh, was really attracted to me, sorry. Um, trying to um, present an alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative, um, there's a lot of complaining, basically saying China's Belt and Road Initiative, its building of infrastructure is not effective or that it is, that it's building debt, or that it's environmentally unfriendly. Well, if you're going to counter that, you need to have a real alternative that is effective, and often that is going to mean providing real money and real technological alternatives. Uh, and we'll see how that works out in this idea of the Build Back Better World or the EU's connectivity strategy. Let me talk then a little bit um, about influence and different types uh, of, of influence. We, again, we've heard a lot today uh, or the last couple of days about different kinds of influence, often media influence um, or information influence. Um, but the type of influence that I spend a lot of time looking at is more of the economic influence, the kinds of interdependence that countries around the world uh, find themselves interdependent economic situations in terms of trade, investment, and finance with China. Um, on the one hand, I think it's obvious that China's economic influence has grown. China has become a much larger trade partner, investment partner, financial partner with countries all around the world. A couple of us were talking the other day about this map that was in The Economist uh, a few weeks ago, just showing the difference in trade volumes between China, comparing the US and China in 2000 and 2020, and China's share in global trade has just grown dramatically over that time. Uh, we've already heard at this conference and the ways in which China's influence is just sort of obvious or in our face when it comes to, say, who gets to decide what a proper map looks like uh, or China's digital finance. Um, it's sort of obvious that these things are out there. Um, but on the one hand, that's not necessarily new. In fact, it's been growing for at least the last 20 or 30 years. There's a sense that it's somehow brand new. Uh, it's certainly been growing in many parts of, of the world. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that that growing economic interdependence gets China what it wants. And you don't have to look much further than Southeast Asia. Yes, there are some examples of, say, Cambodia. Uh, where there's a very close alignment, but there are also countries that push back, even smaller, poorer, weaker countries that do not do China's bidding. In fact, if you look throughout ASEAN, that's, that's it's a real mixed picture. So I think we need to be careful in saying, yes, the interdependence, the economic the size of China's economic relations, its economic power in general has grown, but does that always get China what it wants? Not necessarily. Um, I think one example of this, and we'll just see how it plays out, is with COVID. China's promised a lot uh, in terms of vaccine diplomacy, providing vaccines around the world. How effective are the vaccines compared to other vaccines? How open is China to even telling its own people, let alone the rest of the world, about how effective the vaccines are um, and how that's going to roll out? But there's certainly been a big effort to say, well, China can come to the rescue in terms of vaccines or prior to that uh, with personal protective equipment. Um, and then there is, in, in general, this idea that China is trying to sell that its own response, and maybe the one that it can help provide in terms of governance to other countries, will be more effective than that provided by democratic government. Certainly it's made a big play of, of this. But how far can China actually push this in terms of a resolution? Can China really help solve the health crisis, governance crisis, economic crisis that's certainly going to come in the wake or is already here uh, in light of COVID. So just to, to caution that we need to be careful in thinking about the relationship uh, between the potential and the limits of China's influence. Let me talk just a little bit more about some of those limits uh, and then I will conclude. Um, so the first one is I think we can see some of the examples of the ways in which it's one thing to declare your intention to have influence or to declare your ambitions or goals and there's a lot of talk about China's ambitions to be a global leader including from some of China's officials themselves but it's one thing to say it it's another thing to do it 
And I think we already have some evidence of some of these challenges or limitations to China's influence. So one of them we can see in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in China's development diplomacy in general. China has promised a lot. Basically, it's almost made the argument that building infrastructure is the equivalent of providing development solutions that maybe have never been provided before. Well, is it working out that way? Not necessarily. Uh, this is a very complicated picture, but the idea that you can simply say the BRI is providing development or a given infrastructure project is going to solve a country's economic challenges is not nearly so simple and there's been backlash um, uh, for China in this way. Um, China's own exposure as a result of its increasing trade, investment, and, and finance has brought risks to it. Maybe one of the biggest and first examples of this uh, was in the case of Libya in 2011, uh, where China unexpectedly and Chinese firms were caught up in the middle of a geostrategic crisis, uh, lost a lot of money, had to do a rescue of 35,000 Chinese citizens. So as China's influence grows, that also redounds on China itself. It creates complications and risks which it is trying to manage. And in fact, what we see over the last few years is a rapid decrease in the outflow of China's finance and investment, including for the Belt and Road. We see an almost complete cutoff of official Chinese finance to Latin America, for example, where it had been in the tens of billions of dollars for many years prior to, to that. So examples of some of these difficulties and then just simple mistakes that China and Chinese firms have made in, for instance, building infrastructure projects, a big dam project uh, in, in Myanmar is a pretty good example of this. Um, COVID, again, the challenge of being able to fix the world's health uh, and governance and economic solutions, very likely China has oversold what it's going to be able to do, even as it criticizes the way the crisis has been dealt with in many other parts of the world. Uh, global public opinion in many ways, especially and including in Europe and the United States, is souring, but there's also just a realization in many parts of the world that the promises that China made are not necessarily what it can provide. And I think this is a lot of what we see in the 17 plus one structure uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, a realization that China promised a lot and wasn't necessarily able to deliver on, on all of that. So there are certainly limits. Um, I would caution though that some of these limits, mistakes, and even the the limits on Chinese government control over its own businesses and people, uh, this can be very disruptive. So influence can be disruptive. So the opposite of not being influential in a way can also be really disruptive and including in the way that China interprets this. So if a dam project goes wrong in next door Myanmar and the Chinese government doesn't really understand why and says, oh, the US did it, this creates cycles of mistrust and you can see examples of this, and it's probably only going to get worse around the world. So let me make just a few conclusions, um, and then we can have some more discussion. Um, I think that the growing US-China rivalry is certainly going to exacerbate some of these concerns that I've mentioned about distrust and questions of truth. Uh, certainly at a national level, I think the US and China have entered a period where there is very limited trust. Um, I think it is, uh, there's a version of this uh, that I see in some of my work uh, in Europe, um, maybe not to the same extent, but we certainly see a decrease in trust, including uh, on questions of interdependence with China on many different issues, on economic issues, university students, educational research and R&D research on many different aspects. Um, I think we know far too little in the end about China's influence, especially its economic influence and other aspects. I think the research community is starting to, to pick up a little bit uh, and learn more, but there are many, many different issues. We just don't know enough about in China's influence uh, and the, 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 just the uh, opacity of much of what China has done uh, in terms of its trade, investment, financial, and other relationships around the world exacerbates this. So there's a lot of work to be done in trying to increase what we know about China's influence and understanding what we even mean by influence 
the negative uh, aspects of it versus types that also may redound again on, on China. Um, I think as I've sat here the last few days, one thing that I do see a need for, and maybe as DCN extends some of its network into Southeast Asia and Latin America, I think there is a real opportunity uh, to build capacity and knowledge and to shed some light on some of these relationships that I've said, including about economic influence and economic interdependence. Um, just knowing more lets people make better decisions, and I certainly see a lot of civil society groups, again, in reasons like Latin America um, and Southeast Asia as well as Africa, needing to, wanting to know more, sometimes lacking some of the resources to, to do that, and I think sometimes digital communications can help with that and connecting groups across countries and regions. So with that, I'll conclude. Thanks. Um, is China more strategic, long-term oriented when developing global influence than such powers such as Russia or the USA? That's a great question. China likes to cultivate the image of its long-term thinking. And certainly you see a lot of documents uh, that come out of the Chinese government which show how strategic and long-term some of that thinking is, including in some of the, the regions that I've just talked about, Latin America, Africa, you get these white papers or policy documents which explain exactly what the Chinese government's priorities are over a very long term, and it aligns incentives for, for firms, for example, uh, to, to go and fulfill some of those objectives. Um, but I think this is often missold um, in terms of how much the reality lines up with that. There is, there is some. And what I hear a lot, for example, in the Latin American case is, China's got a plan for our region, but we don't have a plan for, for China. So there's definitely this gap and a perception gap. And, uh, and again, China likes to be seen as being the sort of uber strategist. Um, I think Henry Kissinger had a lot to do with this view of China as being playing on a three-dimensional chessboard and everyone else just playing on two-dimensional one. I think, again, I think that's, that's oversold, but there is something to the fact, again, you got a one-party state. Um, it can do some of that planning, which is just very different, for example, from the United States and the, the political cycle. Um, so we're right now in the US going through this process and the, the Biden team will be rolling out its various uh, national strategies. Um, but that could be overturned and those will overturn some of the, the Trump strategies. In fact, if you try to look up the, some of the, the policy documents from the Trump administration, those are just gone. Um, so if you want to see what the U.S. strategy is, you've got to wait for the new team to, to roll that out. Um, but again, these are just different, different um, political systems that it doesn't necessarily mean that the Chinese one is more uh, effective at the end of the day. Russia, I'll defer on Russia. I just I don't know enough about that, and I think we're going to have more of an opportunity, especially in the next session, to hear about how, how long-term strategic uh, Russia is. The one thing I will say on this, though, is that it is... Russia is much more willing, I think, to be disruptive, um, directly disruptive of the status quo. And I see this in the example of Venezuela, for example. China wants its money and a sort of friendship with Venezuela. Russia was really eager to just thumb its nose at, at the United States in case of support for, for the Maduro government. Okay. Um, your next, okay, you have quite a few, so. Maybe let's try to be succinct for the next few. Um, but um, China learned a lot from Russia. But, what, uh, but did they not also learn a different diplomacy and how to work with poorer countries differently than Western countries? So I think that one thing that we can say that China learned from Russia was don't let your Communist Party collapse. I mean, that's a huge lesson, and the, the Communist Party of China just constantly reiterates, like, let's not give in the game uh, as our counterparts uh, in the Soviet Union did. I think that 
China really has established, it's been a very global country. I mean, it's, it's trade connections um, primarily, but it's investment and financial, it's economic connections. It's deeply, deeply interdependent. It's way more open than some of its counterparts, say in Japan or, or Korea, or way, way, way more open than the Soviet Union was or Russia is. And the Chinese economy is just much more full, multifaceted than, than Russia is today. So I think, in general, China just has a much more globalized view of the world uh, across the board. Thank you. Do you see a significant change in trajectory under president, uh, the current president versus previous Chinese leaders? Do you see more of a danger now from China? That's, that's the multi-million dollar question. Uh, absolutely there are distinctions. Uh, the president, uh, head of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping, has taken the country in a direction where certainly openness, freedom of expression, has been dramatically limited. Uh, the idea that the economy would continue to liberalize as an engine of economic growth, that has changed in favor of more support for state-owned enterprises, government's direct role in foreign policy being uh, ass assertive. All of those are absolutely true. And yet, I see many, many aspects that are continuous. Uh, including all of these efforts at reassurance and wanting to be liked and, and the emphasis on development and stability, those have been there for a very long time and they will continue to drive the policies. So Xi Jinping wants to be seen as the big man, and he is, um, uh, and he's certainly taken the country in some very disturbing different directions, but there's a lot of continuity behind it as well. What do you think about the U.S. policy of being tougher on China? during the Trump and Biden administrations? That's another tough one. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about the election cycle, and we see a lot of the people in the Biden administration who were part of these discussions, was it's not enough to be tough or to talk tough. We have to have effective competition. So competition is the name of the game under the Biden administration. I think the idea under the Trump administration is we must stand up to China. Previous presidential administrations have been too soft, haven't understood the downsides, the risks of interdependence and cooperation with China, and we need to stand up. Certainly the Biden administration has continued much of that language, but the idea is being effective and working with allies. Events of the last few days have really challenged that in the context of the transatlantic relationship, though, and certainly allies of the U.S. in Asia will also, also be looking on. So again, it's a question of effective implementation and cooperation and competitiveness. Um, do you think the recognition of Asia as major economic hub and where the financial growth is can have an influence on how China is perceived globally? Another good one. Um, well, yeah, absolutely, but it's, it's not clear what that's going to mean. I think a lot of the discussions and the thing to focus on to answer this question is really uh, discussions about the Indo-Pacific region. So the United States has really changed its framing of the region of what was once considered the Asia-Pacific, uh, and it's now focused more on um, the Indo-Pacific. And as we see, and we'll see in the next few weeks, uh, this is a, a hot discussion in Europe as well. The EU uh, has its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Three member states uh, in the European Union have Indo-Pacific strategies. And much of this is about the world outside of the Asian or the Indo-Pacific world outside of China that is also vitally important for countries in the United States and, and, and in, in Europe. But the trick is, is this... Uh, an alignment against China? Does it indicate uh, a coalition against China? And I think in Europe this isn't going to go very far, but that's more or less the direction that U.S. policy is pushing in. Interesting response. Um, do you think that China being more business-oriented than Soviet Union makes it a less ideological adversary for the U.S.? That's great. I think one thing that is sort of underappreciated is how similar the U.S. and China are in terms of their entrepreneurial spirit. China is a freewheeling 
economy, yes, there's absolutely the state-controlled element and state-owned enterprises, but boy, has it got a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, sort of Wild West attitude. So there's that, that real similarity uh, between the two, two places. And I do think that, that this drives a lot of China's policy, but it hasn't given up the fact that it's a one-party state led by the Chinese Communist Party, which is the same Communist Party that's been there since 1949. This means that ideology is incredibly important in China, and it's led by, by that one party. So they're not giving up on that, but the extent to which they sort of fulfill their ideals of being, you know, striving towards socialism, well, there's some major contradictions there. Last one, um, do you think the solution of the trade war between US and China is in the internal power to have stability or in the influence in the community? So I guess part of the answer to this would be that it, can there be a solution? I think this was always on the table going back to the, um, the, the trade negotiations between the Trump administration and, and China. Um, some of the asks that the, the Trump administration had were sort of fundamental changes in China's economy in terms of openness, its relationship to state-owned enterprises, support for, for, uh, for industry and its economy. And these were things that were going to be really, really difficult to get China to move on. Yes, they, they gave some concessions in the supposedly the phase one trade, trade deal. But I think this is the big question. Can there be an accommodation or not, and I don't think we know where we are on this yet. We still have to wait and see what the Biden administration's asks are in terms of the next stage of, of this. But I expect trade policy to continue to be very adversarial. Matt, thank you so much. A round of applause, please. For